The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 791, for Monday, December 2nd, 2019. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all of your questions and tips and cool stuff found and we mash them all together into an agenda. And then we kind of sort of follow the agenda, uh, hopefully putting together a cohesive show for you that allows you and us, everybody, the goal, all of us combined individually, collectively, is that we each learn Five new things every single time we get together. You're allowed to learn more than five. That is okay. Nothing wrong with that. Sponsors for this episode include the following URLs. Eero.com slash MGG. Capterra.com slash MGG. ExpressVPN.com slash MGG. And SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. Just to mix it up on you. We'll talk about why you want to go to each of those URLs in a moment. But you can get to them all at MacGeekCab.com, so don't forget about that. For now, here in Snowmageddon, Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in not snowy, but more sleety, rainy, yucky, fearful Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. That's right. Yeah, you were you were you were in the the belt that might get snow and and you didn't. So yeah. That, that no, makes, like, makes caused, life a little uh, easier. Yeah, though I heard it caused a lot of chaos throughout the country. It was, uh, well, it's winter. You know it's, what else happens in well, winter, Well, it's not Dave? winter. It's fall, mm-hmm. but but it will be winter it, soon. Yeah. Is it technically? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, until the 21st, I think. It's, oh. either the, it's somewhere between the 20th and the 22nd of December every year that we switch into what we call winter. I don't, I don't know... Uh, I'll look up winter solstice 2019 and it will tell me Saturday, December 21st at 1119 PM Eastern time. So there you go. Well, all I know is before that, Dave, you know what happens that always warms my heart is the leaf fairy comes. Oh, and takes away all your leaves that you've bagged up. I I did, you know, I did leaves, uh, this weekend, you know, uh, you bag them up, you put them on the sidewalk and, you know, I went out to do my chores this morning and, uh, when I came back, they were gone. That's great. Just, just. Pick them up. It's amazing. It's amazing. Your tax dollars hard at work. That's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we have your Mac Geek Gub dollars hard at work here on three quick tips. One is a quick tip reprise, but it's such a good one that it it's worth doing. So here we go. Starting with the two new ones. The first from Graham. He says, while playing around with Sidecar and Mac OS Catalina, I was checking out what the zoom slash full screen green dot would do when on the iPad slash sidecar display In doing that, I left the cursor floating over the top of the green dot a little longer than usual and discovered that there is now, yes, now a drop down set of options that appear, which include tile window to left of screen and tile window to right is of screen, as well as an option to move the window between the iPad and the Mac. And just like holding down the option key changes the green button between full screen and zoom action, which is a bonus quick tip. I actually did not. I did not know until this moment, in fact, that the option key changed the function of the green button between full screen and zoom mode. Uh, He says the option key also modifies the tile actions to become move actions. So uh, that means that where if you just float over the green dot, It says tile window to left of screen or tile window to right of screen. If you hit the option key, it says move window to left side of screen or move window to right side of screen. And then, of course, enter full screen changes to zoom with the option key held down too. this. This is the beauty of quick tips. I say that all the time about quick tips. There's so much to learn. And uh, and now I, I've learned at least two things here. So uh, like we're already on track, which is excellent. So thank you, Graham. Good stuff. Thoughts about that, John, before we move on to Tony here. Mm, move on to Tony. Tony. I like this little tip. Tony says, as of today, me emojis can only be sent from iOS and iPad OS, but not Mac OS. However, 
If you want to send them from your Mac, open any synced writing application, say notes, open that on your iPhone uh, and type in your collection of Memoji icons. Then let iCloud sync that to your Mac and you can copy and paste from that synced document in notes uh, offload the oh, you, he says you could offload the icons to a folder or link them to a text expander snippet or keyboard shortcut he says I imagine you could also get fancy with some kind of continuity shortcut too. he says you could even email them to yourself and that way you can send your memojis from your Mac right there no problem and he of course included one of himself in the email that he sent from his Mac I like that tip that's a great idea so just go take all your memojis paste Paste them one by one into a uh, into a document, and you're good to go. Smart. I like emoji it. being a somewhat personalized representation of yourself, which I have actually not activated that though. You haven't when I ran your emojis yet, John. Oh, you need to create your emojis and create several of them. That way, you know you. Now, can are they are they uh, are they generated from a photograph of no, you or you just don't you make just, them yourself you, okay you pick it okay. yeah 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 so now that i think about it wouldn't it be cool if they could take a photograph of you and kind of match it um sure mm, no. yeah but but this way you get to accessorize and you can you know yep, you, yep. Can, you can make it look like you want to look as opposed to what a picture might actually look like or what it might interpret a picture to look like so yeah it's good uh and then our 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 quick tip reprise. Uh, he is, Eric comes from Eric, who says, recently my son realized that in iOS, when in a text entry box, holding down on the space bar and sliding to the left or right moves the cursor. That's true. That puts and it's a, it's a great tip. We've been talking about it for a while. It's existed for in different capacities for uh, at least two versions of iOS, maybe even longer. But only recently did I truly like finally get over the hump and start using this as I should be using it because what it does is it puts your, uh, it turns your iPad or your iPhone keyboard into a trackpad and then you can just drive around and position the cursor exactly where you want. And it's super handy. He says you can move left and right. That's true. If you're in say messages, but if you're in say a notes document, you can move up and down with it too. The, the, you know, the trackpad function moves in every direction and you will see the keyboard sort of grays out when you uh, when you hold it down and and then you can just move around when you let go. Your keyboard reappears. So very good stuff, Eric. Thank you. Thoughts on that, John? Cool. Um, not about that, but I'm going to I'm going to give you a quick tip that Great. I was not aware of until today. So, um, you know how a lot of times you will activate a service and you will be texted a activation code. So they make sure that you are who you say you are. Yeah. Well, I just did this today and I didn't realize this may have been an iOS for a while. And I know that um, actually both on the Mac and on iOS, it, it's usually pretty smart that when it receives a code, it'll actually realize that fact and like automatically paste it in sometimes into the field that needs it. Yeah. But um, no, so I got one today. It was actually from Redbox, but they're like, yeah, you know, get a dollar fifty off, blah, blah, blah. And then they show the code and it's underlined. And I'm like, that's interesting. Well, you know, let me let me highlight that, you know, or like, you know, select all or select item. Sure. But when I press down on the code, Dave, it came up with a thing saying copy code. And this was in the messages app. Yeah, so oh, it, it underlined it, which means that it kind of knew that it was probably an activation code. But when I pressed and held on it, it said copy code. Now, did it, it not it automatically try and enter that? Correct. Yes. Oh, interesting. So you had to go and copy it. Huh. That's interesting. I wonder how it would have known that it was a code, but chosen not. Maybe it didn't realize the field that you were on was the field that wanted this, this activation code. Huh. that's pretty cool. That's pretty good, man. I like it. Yeah, so I saved, you know, I saved dollar fifty, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that um that whole code thing that they put into Safari and linking it from messages, uh it like it works so well that it's easy to overlook how difficult that must have been to to make work as smoothly as it does on like its first foray out of the gate. I, I really I'm blown away by it by by just how smooth it is 
you, you kind of feel like, oh, it's been there forever. And of course it hasn't. Um, yeah. So I like it. It's, it's good. It's good. But that, I, I had no idea that you could go into messages and tap on. It. I mean, I, I know you can go and tap on things and, and choose copy, but that's interesting that it identified it as a code and said instead copy code. Yeah. I like so I that. don't know if they have some database saying, oh, okay, if it's from Breadbox and yeah. it looks like this, then it's a code or if it's from. So, so I don't know if they have some sort of database or algorithm. Well, well that's the, that's the part because- that makes it magic, right? Is that it's, it's somehow it just knows. Yeah, it's pretty good. Huh. All right. Well, we've got a bunch of cool stuff found to talk about. First, I want to talk about our first sponsor for today. Um, ExpressVPN.com slash MGG is where you're going to go. But what I didn't realize is just how much content on, say, Netflix is available to people not in the USA because I'm in the USA and then I started digging a little bit and I realized I wanted to watch Rick and Morty because my son and I like to watch Rick and Morty. He, he's almost 18. So bear that in mind. Rick and Morty's not necessarily for your five year old. Uh, <laughs> no. But but my 18 year old or almost 18 year old son and I like to watch Rick and Morty. That's not in Netflix. Well, it is in Netflix in France. And I was able to use ExpressVPN to connect to a France endpoint, and then boom, I could watch Rick and Morty in Netflix. Super, super simple. I just had to refresh the app. Good to go because ExpressVPN hides your IP and lets you control where you want sites to think you're coming from. And you can choose from almost a hundred different countries. So just think about all the different Netflix libraries that you can go through. And, you know, it's not just Netflix. ExpressVPN works with any streaming service, Hulu, right? BBC's iPlayer, YouTube, you name it. Uh, There are a lot of VPNs out there. I've been using ExpressVPN now for a little over a year. It's super fast. Like it works on every network I've tried. There's never any buffering or lag and... I was able to stream in HD, no problem. And it's compatible with, you know, all your devices, your phones, your tablets, all of that stuff. Your Mac, of course. So you can watch what you want on the go. You can even watch on the big screen wherever you are. So as I said, expressvpn.com slash MGG is where you want to go. And the reason you want to go there is because for you as a Mac Geek Cab listener, you get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free so you can support the show watch what you want and protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash m g g our thanks to expressvpn for sponsoring this episode i also want to thank pdf pen 11 from smile we love the folks at smile because they make such great tools and we're about to talk about cool stuff found. The reality is we are talking about cool stuff found because PDF pen 11 is the ultimate tool for editing PDFs on the Mac and PDF pen 11.2. The most recent update lets you easily edit the content inside of table cells. You can change typeface font size and other text formatting with PDF pens font bar Add, edit, remove images from your documents with PDF Pen. And of course, PDF Pen for Mac supports Mac OS Catalina. And PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone is ready for the 13s in those two families. Definitely something you want to check out. I, I don't know how I would live without PDF Pen. I probably use it. I don't want to say I use it every day, but I think I use it about three days a week, either on my iPhone or iPad or on my Mac just makes it so that I can get all these things done no matter where I am and I don't have to think about it. So go check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast and that's where you're going to be able to get all the information. They, of course, will ask where you heard about it. We assume you already know the answer to that question. Uh, so I'll leave that to you folks. But uh, but go check it out. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Our thanks to Smile for making PDF Pen 11 and for sponsoring this episode. All right. Ben has a, well, he, let's let Ben say it. Here you go, Ben. Hi, John and Dave in sunny Tacoma park, Maryland. This is Ben Rosenthal. 
This morning I was listening to your discussion in episode 790 about earphones with or without transparency functions and felt aligned with Dave's comment about not wanting to entrust his spatial awareness to a bunch of mechanical sensors. I was listening to all this while bicycling through the bone conduction speakers of my Koros <laughs> Omni helmet. I've been riding with a Koros helmet since the company's first Kickstarter campaign delivered in fall 2016 and recently replaced my original Koros Lynx with the higher quality Omni. In addition to better speakers, the Omni also has inbuilt taillights that flash for extra visibility in darkness. These helmets offer the ultimate in audio transparency while bicycling, a bone conduction speaker on each strap positioned to contact the upper cheekbone while leaving the ear open to external sound. The helmet also contains a microphone, which makes it possible to accept phone calls. It's all Bluetooth, so no wires dangling between my ears and my phone, which is safely tucked in my pocket while riding. Each helmet comes with a small remote for play, pause, track, and volume control, which can be clamped onto the handlebar. The overall audio quality is quite good, though in noisy settings like around overpasses and at busy intersections, I usually pause my media. In any case, whether listening to the Mac Geek Gab or talking on the phone, Koros offers a great product for safe media consumption while bicycling. Very cool. That, wow. I wish I had known about that, uh, well, years ago, but certainly this past summer, I, I tend to ride my bike quite a bit over the, uh, you know, over the summer does the exercise and uh, also just to get out there. That's, man, what a great idea yeah i gotta look into getting one of these john this is this is cool you ride your bike too right yes but i don't have any uh yeah the bone conduction thing always um always intrigued me yeah yeah it makes and to have it built into a bike helmet I, that's pretty good i like it it's yeah good. and you want to wear a helmet so you don't crack your skull because if you do then you won't be able to listen to to Mac Geek Cabin. No. Yeah, you want to you want to protect your brain. <laughs> Trust me on this, folks. Yep. Yep. Yep, for sure. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Thank you, Ben. Good stuff. From listener Chris, uh, he says, in a recent episode, a listener talked about how he's had trouble finding web pages he knows that he has visited. He shared a tip for methods to search the Safari browsing history. But I wanted to remind everyone that the utility history hound from our Friends at St. Clair Software collects and consolidates your browsing history from all the popular browsers. He says, and I always have better results finding web pages I previously visited using this utility than I do searching within the browsers themselves. He says, and because Safari browsing history is synced between all of your devices, your iOS browsing is included in the search as well. I like it. That's pretty good, Chris. I, you know, I'm a, obviously a big fan of, of default folder from St. Clair software and also a big fan of app tamer. I've been aware of history hound, but never, I, I, I knew it by name only. I had no idea what it did. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Chris, it's great stuff. Pretty cool. Huh, John? Yeah, I just did that today. We were talking about something or other and yeah, I did it within Safari, but yeah, if you use multiple browsers, then uh, that sounds like that's the thing uh, you should be using. That is, I like it. I like it. All right. Mike says, I recently upgraded my 2009 iMac to a 2017 27-inch 5K iMac with a one terabyte Fusion drive. I have several USB drives attached and really started to notice how slow some of them are. For one thing, my USB hubs were both USB 2. I did some testing with Blackmagic Disk Speed Test app, a great app that's available for free on the Mac App Store. We'll put a link in the show notes, he says. Uh, or I, I say, uh, he says, and I found I was getting read and write speeds from uh, about 150 megabytes per second mm. for the Fusion drive to 26 megabytes for my clone mm. drive and even nine megabytes for a miscellaneous USB 2 storage drive that I keep connected. Thanks to your show, he says, I opted for an external SSD to boot from. I got a Sabrent Rocket XTRM 2 terabyte Thunderbolt 3 external SSD on sale for 466. I also upgraded my hubs to USB 3. Now he says I'm getting 2200 megabytes a second on the SSD and 120 megabytes a second on the clone drives. It feels super zoomy. He says I put the USB 2 drive into cold storage. 
Thank you for sharing that, Mike. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll put a link to that Sabrent uh, SSD in the, in the show notes. What a, what it, it really makes a huge difference um, for sure. So, you know, I, 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 it, it, you, especially with um, Mojave and Catalina, if you're doing clones, you want to be doing those clones to SSDs because those operating systems especially are really not built to be booted from a, uh, a rotational drive, a solely rotational drive. And it can be really slow the moment you need to boot from that clone. So, I mean, it's a nice way to know you've booted from your clone that it's just dog slow. But beyond that, it starts to get kind of frustrating. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, I have another one that I've been testing, John, the uh, Lacy mobile SSD. It's a USB, uh, USB C device. And I've been getting 330 to 390 write and read speeds, megabytes per second uh, from this just on a USB three uh, USB C bus, which is great. They they say that they go up to 540 megabytes a second. I have not gotten that, but I did format APFS. So that may be the reason I know APFS is a little slower. Uh, but um, but, you know, and, and I'm using the black magic disk speed test utility, which I know some people some of the, the it is the same one that Mike used in the previous segment there. But um, but some folks will say it doesn't really uh, show you everything with the caching and all that. But anyway, 350 megabytes a second is pretty darn good and makes a huge difference doing those clones and everything. So yet yet another one to check out. I'll put a link to that in the show notes, too. Thoughts, yeah. Mr. Braun? Um, it's interesting though. At first I saw those speeds and I'm like, oh, those speeds kind of, that's not that great. But mm -hmm. then you did them in MB, uppercase B and Mega not lowercase B. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes a big Just difference. Just let everybody know here. A lot of times, um, I don't know if it's like a conspiracy in the computer industry, but they like to measure throughput in usually something bits. And you'll know that because it's a small B. Right. Usually a small b. Well, I've seen I've seen things that say that bits can also be reckon, you know, uh, uh, written as a large b. So it really truly gets confusing. But I I'm with you. I will always write, especially megabits per second and things like that, is capital M and then small bps is how I do it. But I have seen some other people representing it capital B for bits, which I I don't think yeah. is right. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, right. Yeah. So anyways, that's smoking. <laughs> it's smoking. Yeah, no, it's great. That 2200 is, is killer. That's awesome. Yeah. Those internal drives, those NVMe drives in the, the new Macs. I mean, even my MacBook Air, it's like, you know, what, 1200 megabytes a second or something. It's just like ridiculously fast. Yeah. But well, I even pop some in my um, Synology. Um, one of the ones that I have actually has ports for those. And I bought bought a couple of them or yep. a few of them. Yep. And uh yeah, it's a nice form factor, and it even said on the box, fast. Yeah. Really fast. Really fast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in 790, we were also talking about the uh, ISH app that gives you a, a sandbox Linux environment on your iOS devices. And one of the things that I mentioned using that for was to do some network testing. Uh, a few of you, actually several of you, wrote in, and I want to highlight two uh of two of the thing, two of the emails that we got each that had two uh, recommendations to do that without needing a command line on your iPhone. Uh, first comes from listener Bill, who says, try both the Fing app and the Scanny app. Fing is F I N G. Scanny is S C A N Y. Uh, Scanny. I Fing is something we've talked about on the show several times before. It, it, it is, an awesome network scanner. If you need to join a network where I use it all the time, this might seem crazy, but uh, when I play live with different bands, we mostly now all use digital mixers. And then the nice part is we can control our own mixes with our phones or our iPads. Most of the time, the person who's a sound engineer isn't necessarily also a network engineer, and sometimes the mixer, you know, gets turned on in a different order and gets a different IP address. And it's a pain in the neck to try and start 
you know, punching in different IP addresses into the Mixer app, trying to figure out where the Mixer is living today on the Wi-Fi network for the board. Well, using Fing, I just run it. It shows me where it is. I type it in. I tell everybody we're good to go. So Fing, Fing, super handy for that. Highly recommend keeping it on your iPhone and it's available for free. Scanny is one I had not heard of before, John. And it's got all kinds of cool. Yeah. yeah. All kinds of cool network tools, DNS lookups. You can do port scans, geo IP lookups. Uh, you can, of course, scan the network as well. Uh, it is, uh, what is it? Five ninety nine US in the app store for the iPhone. So, um, so thank you for that, Bill. Great. Yeah, great I like those as well, especially when you're on a uh, public Wi-Fi network. Uh-huh. I love running thing to see who's out there. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I could take it a step further and terrify them because it usually will display the name of the device, you know, like Joe's, you know, MacBook. And I almost feel like, you know, saying, Joe, your MacBook, I can see you. That that wouldn't be. Yeah. Well, it just because the machine shows up there doesn't mean that it's sharing any services necessarily. Right. It just. Oh, no. But of course, finding. Yeah. thing and i think this other utility will let you drill down and say oh by the way you know show me what what you know this guy is exposing and you right. know, for the most part it's just exposing naming services and not like file sharing one would hope right depending right on your goal yeah yeah right 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 all right uh all right and then we have uh from listener lewis in response to the same segment he recommends two one is called Nice Trace and the other is PNU. Nice Trace is from the same folks at happymagenta.com that make this scanny app that we just mentioned. Nice Trace does trace routes only, I believe, and is a dollar ninety nine, so uh, a nice option. I think Scanny will do trace routes as well. So for five ninety nine, you get Scanny, which includes the. It seems like includes all the same functionality as Nice Trace. So just bear that in mind. And then one called PNU uh, and PNU is available for free. It is. um, Well, maybe it's not available for free. Maybe I have the wrong link in the show notes here and I have the wrong thing because I don't think the app I wanted was for the Princess Nora Bint Abdularrahman University, if I pronounce that correctly. So PNU is Ping, a network utility offered for free that lets you do uh, all kinds of different uh, things. You can test your connection to different uh, different services and, and that sort of thing, just like we were mentioning in the last show. So uh, I think it is PNU Ping Network Utility, and I will uh, I will put the right link in the show notes. So by the time you get it, you've got the right thing, folks. So there you go. Pretty good, huh, Mr. Braun? Very good. Very good. All right. Um, Andrew Orr at Mac Observer wrote up a cool stuff found or something I consider cool stuff found the other day. It is tracking the trackers dot com. And what it does is you plug in a URL and it tells you if the website that you plugged in tries to hide the trackers that they use by assigning them what are called C names or aliases of their own domain. So for example, let's say we use this tracker that actually we run ourselves called Matomo, right? But I run it through our backbeatmedia.com domain. I don't try to hide actually that one I run at Mac observer. So that's a bad example because we actually run it ourselves and, and it's not, it is at uh, matomo.macobserver.com, which you would see if you looked in our source. But for example, Google analytics, right? We could, create a uh, redirect that instead of making Google analytics load from google.com, we could make it load or look like it's loading from say, you know, GA dot Mac observer.com and hide from you. The fact that we are using Google analytics, we don't do that. Some sites do. And this tool at tracking the trackers.com will show you what, your sites are doing. Apple even does this, believe it or not. In fact, 
The weirdest part, John, is if you put in Apple.com into tracking the trackers, the disguised third-party tracker that Apple says is at securemetrics.apple.com is being attributed to the Adobe Experience Cloud, which seems odd to me. But uh, but there you go. That's at least what it's saying. And it'll it'll tell you what cookies it's leaking and all of that stuff. So, yeah, pretty good. Fun stuff. I always like to know what's going on, John. Don't you? Yeah. Well, if you like to know what's going on, there is another one, Dave. And I was go. actually uh, I, I finally completed my. Um, exploration here. I was looking for this when we were talking about browser extensions a while ago, but there's one called Ghostery or actually Ghostery Light. Which, okay. when you boil it down, it's basically a utility that will show you uh, trackers on the page that you're on. Oh. So if you want to know who's looking over your shoulder. Um, nice. I think we've mentioned Ghostery a couple times on the show. I think, in fact, I think you've brought it up before. But yeah, no, that's a good one. I'll put that in the list. It's good. Good, good. Um, I don't know where I found this one, so I can't give credit. Maybe I just stumbled on it somewhere. But there is... A website called getcap.co, getkap.co, which is an open source screen recorder built with web technology. And it is available for free. You download the app and you can do screen recording just like you can in, say, QuickTime or in ScreenFlow. But you can do it right there on your Mac and uh, and you can do it for free. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Pretty good. And thanks to whoever recommended it to me. I don't, uh, I wish I, I wish I knew where it came from, John, but you know, there you go. Listener, Chris, uh, wait, 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 where are we here? Listener, Chris. Uh, oh yeah. In episode 790, Steve wrote in and we were talking about bridging Wi-Fi between two buildings. Chris reminds us, uh, of the ingenious ENH 500, which is, as he notes, specifically made for this situation. It is fast and has been rock steady for several years now. So I sent this link off to Steve so that he'd have it right away. But I wanted to share it with everybody for 160 bucks. You get this five gigahertz wireless outdoor bridge with a directional antenna, which is the key that we were talking about last week. Uh, since it's got long range uh this one says it will do up to one mile. So that's pretty good. And uh, wow. So, one yeah. mile is what? 3000 feet or something. I, I forget. 5,268 feet. But uh, oh, 5, I, I don't know. Isn't it? Okay. Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't that how I, well, like I'm just doing that Google. off the top of my head? 5,280 feet. So I was off by 12 feet. Sorry about that. I don't know why I had 5268 in my brain, but uh, 5280 is the right one. So there you go. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a lot of feet because I think normal Wi-Fi is normally in the hundreds of feet. Right? Omni, let's say not normal, but because there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing abnormal about this. what Ingenius is doing. It's just that they are doing it in a focused directional way. Whereas, yeah, like like you said, the, the Wi-Fi we have in our homes is omnidirectional and going every direction. And so you you lose you get directionality without or non-directionality without uh but but you sacrifice some some range. But yeah, they're like an order of magnitude less. Yeah, range. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. At best, right? I mean, I I don't know if I get five hundred feet out of Wi Fi here at my house. I mean, I need I need a lot of access points to cover five hundred feet. So yeah, it's pretty good. Although in an open room, uh, you know, line of sight, you probably could get something close to that. Maybe. Yeah, I've I've done some tests in the past, and yeah, I can get two to 300 feet from a uh, 802 AC. Yeah. 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 Without, without walls or anything in the way that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one last little cool stuff found or quick tip. Well, it's cool stuff found if you don't know it about it yet, but we have an app for the Mac geek gab here where you can send in uh, your questions. You can listen to the show. You can make bookmarks and all of that stuff. However, it seems like, at least for some of us, and I'll, I am one of the some of us migrating my phone from an iPhone 10 R to my iPhone 11 pro. And I did the over the air migration. So direct phone to phone, not via iCloud 
for whatever reason, that seems to have broken my ability to get notifications from the Mac Geek Gab app. And I had to delete the app and reinstall it. So if you want notifications that we're starting to do the live stream or a new episode is out, that's basically all we notify you for. We try not to you know, overdo it. Uh, you've got to delete the app and reinstall it if you're not getting them. So I just wanted to mention that here in the show because um, I can't send a notification out to tell you to do that because then it, you wouldn't get it. So I could say if you get this notification, don't worry about it. But, you know, that's that's a little that's overdoing it, isn't it, John? So anyway, there we go. Thoughts on that, John, before we uh, before we move we're on. Gonna, we're not going to send you a notification saying that you're not getting notifications. We would love to. But we can't, well, we are, but we we're doing it here is is just like we're separate, different medium. Although it's possible you're listening to this in the app, even if you're not getting notifications. So, OK, uh, we have well, we've got some more tips. We've got some questions to answer. And I want to talk about our next sponsor, John, which is Eero. In fact, we were just talking about how with our mesh networks from Eero. We can get great coverage throughout our homes and our offices because Eero is the Wi-Fi that your home deserves. In addition to just doing the Wi-Fi, though, you know, Eero is a great router because they've got all kinds of great technology in there to manage your network both inside and out. In fact, with their smart queuing management, they can pretty much eliminate all the buffer bloat problems that those of us on cable modems have when there's, you know, a backup happening or any uh, any of that where you're like uploading all your photos and all of that. Eero smart queuing management just addresses that and it does it in an easy way. In fact, that's sort of how Eero is across the board, isn't it? It's just easy and it just works Eero blankets your whole home with fast reliable wi-fi eliminating poor coverage dead spots and all that buffer bloating so you can have a consistently strong signal and strong connection wherever you need it and it sets up in just minutes you just plug it into your modem or your modem router box if you need to do it that way and you manage it from a super simple app you're gonna love this john and i use it you can use it too and in fact, you can get it real fast. So Eero has fixed buffer bloat problems and coverage problems for us here. And you can get yours fixed as soon as tomorrow. Go to Eero.com slash MGG and then enter code MGG at checkout to get free overnight shipping with your order. That's Eero.com slash MGG code MGG at checkout to get your Eero delivered with free overnight shipping. You have to use the URL to receive this offer. So it's Eero.com slash MGG code MGG and our thanks to Eero for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is Captera at Captera.com slash MGG. What if you could make your work take less work? Well, you can with Captera because Captera helps you find the right software for your needs fast so you can get back to business even faster. And the cool thing is you can compare thousands of software options and read over a million reviews of products from real software users. And that allows you to discover everything you need to make an informed decision and instantly narrow down your favorites, which means you'll have more time in no time, and you can find the right software right now at captera.com slash MGG. You can search at Captera more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing to even yoga studio management software. Like it's really specific. And that's the beauty. You want something built for your business, not just something generic. You want something that's going to work for you so that you can actually do your business and not have to manage the software that is supposed to be helping you manage your business. That's what Captera is for, because they make it easy to discover the right solution fast. So join the millions of people who use Captera each month and find the right tools for their business. Visit Captera.com slash MGG for free today. That's right. All of this is free. 
capterra.com slash MGG to find the tools to make an informed decision for your business. That's capterra.com slash MGG. It's free. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash MGG. Captera is software selection simplified and our thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. John, you want to take us to uh, tell us uh, about what you learned woe, about, but then a, a tale of not woe. All right. That works. <clears throat> so I think this happened, Dave. So um, tell us all recent. Well, if you recall recently, I was talking about, you know, issues I was having with my uh, MacBook Pro after I upgraded to Catalina, the time machine was, you know, stuttering and I went to disutility and I was getting errors and I'm like, this ain't right. Okay. So, um, so I finally threw down the gauntlet and uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to reformat the internal drive and restore from a clone. And lo and behold, all the errors went away. Oh, that's good. Right. And uh, time machine worked and, uh, and I didn't get the errors and disutility. So I'm like, okay, that, that fixed the problem. So, you know, make a clone folks. But then I noticed one thing when I was going through answering some of the questions um, uh, for the podcast, Dave, I noticed that the signature for my reply was not going to the correct. It wasn't putting the correct signature. And I'm like, well, that's crazy talk because uh, I run mail mail suite. Right. 2019 um, from our friends at small cube. And I'm like, well, duh. So I looked, and sure enough, it was not installed. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I got, you know, something, something went wrong. So I downloaded the installer, installed it. And, uh, you know, part of the, the you know, the, uh, the dance you have to go through is um, in mail. Uh, when you install a new mail plugin with Apple's mail, you have to go to preferences, um, general, and there's going to be a tab saying, uh, manage plugins. I'm like, okay, oh, maybe it's not, you know, enabled. And so I went to that screen and you know what I saw, Dave? Nothing. And I'm like, mm, okay, that's not good. <laughs> so fortunately, and uh, although they're not sponsoring this show, I think they have in the past, but, but, but we love them anyways. Um, so I wrote to their support and I said, basically, yeah, here's what happened. You know, I installed mail suite 2019, uh, you have to enable full disk access, which I did. And they let you know that. Sure. When I went to this, I saw nothing, you know, so I dug in a little bit, you know, being a troubleshooting type of guy. And, you know, I went to home library mail and I saw a small cube folder. And in the bundles folder, I saw a small cube mail bundle folder in there. So I'm like, all right. And installed it properly. Right. As far as I can tell. So what the heck is going on? Now, there's also a, a file called pluginconsole.log. I don't know if that's a general thing for mail or if it was specific to this one. Okay. And so I sent that off to them. Sure. <clears throat> and then I heard nothing. And I'm like, oh, gosh, this is terrible. The reason I heard nothing is because the reply that came from the same day from Beth on their support team was put in my spam folder, Dave. What the heck? I mean, how? why would it even classify something so complex as spam? But anyways, so uh, but here's what Beth has said. Um, we've had several reports of plugins not being visible, uh, as you pointed out. Um, one cause of this is that because people have their user folder on an external drive, and that was not my case, but just one tip to people that may be a cause for you not seeing your mail plugins as far as, as far as they know. Um, but she said also, um, the other reason is that the uh, a certain folder may not be a sim link, um, and you can tell something's a sim link because when you look at the folder, it has a little arrow in the bottom uh, left hand corner, I believe. That wasn't the case either. So I'm like, okay. So what, nope. what was the case? I'm just trying to help us get to like the, you found a very cool thing here, and I want to teach people it before we lose them. So what is right. the cool thing? So they did so. And their final statement was, if it any, isn't any of these things, I just want to include those mm -hmm. because it could help people. But if it's not any of those things, then she said, the issue is with Apple's data vault, which was introduced with system integrity protection in Mojave. It can be fixed, it can be fixed but it's a bit of an elaborate process. And I'm like, hit me. Um, basically, the explanation is that uh, they have these things called data vaults when you have system integrity protection. 
And Mail will keep a copy of plugins in a hidden folder. The problem is, is that if there's a discrepancy between the ones in the hidden data vault and the ones in your normal user directory, you're not going to see them. Oh, interesting. So it should, in theory, migrate whatever you put into your what we see, what you and I see as our mail plugins folder. It should migrate that to this data vault. But if mm -hmm. it doesn't, then it data vault is where it's actually reading these plugins from, it seems, or at least they have to be in both places. Otherwise, it, it won't read them or it won't activate them. Correct. So Got I don't it. know if it was because I did the migration and the reformatting that maybe have, has caused this because it didn't happen on my Mac Mini. The thing is, I have not reformatted my drive on my Mac Mini. So I'm wondering if the reformat and the migra and the, the uh, restoring from the clone may have caused this. But anyways, the solution to this is pretty straightforward. So first you have to disable SIP. Um, I don't know. We may copy. Uh, I don't know if we should copy the text of this. Or I, I'm hoping they have a link to what she sent me. I'm, I'm assuming okay. they do. Yeah, we'll look for it. Otherwise, we can put it in the forums. But yeah. But yeah. basically, it's uh, the three steps are as follows. You disable SIP and you do that by restarting your Mac. You go into recovery and then the terminal, you say CSR util disable. Okay. That then allows you to do the next step, which is to remove the data vault that is out of sync and that's in home library containers com.apple.mail data data vaults and then you re-enable sip and lo and behold i then saw the plugin when i went back to the page nice i like it and just to boot i you know uh there's actually a, a cyber monday that that term grates on my nerves but um, so i actually renewed my license for uh, for it because uh, so that was fantastic support and i i got to think they were ripping their hair out trying to figure this out because i'm sure i'm not the only one that wrote them saying um i can't see your plug in right <laughs> right yeah that's interesting yeah we'll have to we'll have to see if they um if they have a a link to this that, that we can put in the show notes so i'll let you shoot them an email and, and find that out. Yeah, that's great stuff. That's really good. Um, yeah, I, I had no idea about this data vaults thing. So I like it. That's good. Uh, we have had in the last two shows uh, discussions about connecting to your Mac remotely. And one of the things that we talked about, in fact, the thing that I recommended is as sort of the main way to do it is this app called Screens Connect. And I was uh, miss I misinterpreted how this app worked. Uh, and I what I had said was, oh, yeah, it, it just, you know, they there's a proxy server and it uh, allows you to it, it coordinates the connection without opening any holes on your in your firewall. That's not true. And we talked about that in the last episode. However, it's not actually insecure, which is what I we were led to believe in the last episode or at least it can be made secure very, very easily. And the way that that's done is inside screens connect, go to the preferences. And in general, there is a checkbox for use remote login. And then in parentheses, SSH tunneling more secure, it says, but slower. And what this does is instead of opening up the, uh, VNC port on your router. It opens up a different port, not the default, but a different port for SSH. And then uh, you're good to go. And it will secure the connection. It encrypts it because SSH is there. And then it sends this, you know, remote access or VNC uh, connection across this secure tunnel that's created with SSH. So it can be done very securely without really having to do much of anything. I think this use remote tunneling or use remote login box is not yet checked by default. Uh, but Luke Vondal, who is the uh, engineer that writes this, the developer, I should say, that writes this, I guess either term is, is appropriate, uh, says that uh, he's considering enabling SSH by default in a future update just for this reason so that everything is good to go. 
Uh, so there you go. That that is I, that makes me feel a whole lot better about this. And I appreciate everybody writing in and asking about it and all of that good stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to uh, to everybody who wrote in. I think Chris and Robert and of course to Luke at, uh, at Adobe who who makes screens connect so that we can all use it. But yeah, good stuff. Thoughts on that, John, before we move on. Why can't I? I could swear I had um, launched it. I think it's it's part of um, setup, but I can't seem to find it now. But I, I thought I ran it and looked for a like little secure checkbox, but I, I couldn't find it. But apparently you did. So, um, the, the, so there's two apps that uh, that we're talking about here. One is called Screens, and the other is called Screens Connect, and I think screens is a part of set app, but screens okay. connect is, is not, but, but screens is the paid for app screens connect is available for free. So you can just go to, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes, but you can go and download that from adovia.com. And then, uh, then, you know, you can, then you're good to go. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So that, that should do it for you. And then Screens Connect just runs and, and manages the, the remote connection, which is great. So good. Makes sense. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. So I guess the message is that, yeah, basic screen sharing typically will not offer any sort of protection. So not necessarily. And that's why Luke built this SSH mm -hmm. tunneling into the into the, you know, into the app so that you don't. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. All right. And then Raj found a fascinating thing. You know, so Raj says, I was browsing my Apple Music library and noticed that several songs were unplayable with the message. This song is no longer available, even though I knew I had purchased it or uploaded it to my iCloud Music library in the past. To figure out how many of these files were in my library, I made a smart playlist filtered by iCloud status and saw that many of them were files I had uploaded from my Mac years ago. Thankfully, I had a backup of these songs on my Mac, so I added a second rule for a location of on this computer. I then copied the files out to a folder, deleted them from my music library, and then re-imported, which caused them to re-upload, and the problem was fixed. He says, I think the reason is this. It seems that if a record label or artist decides to pull music matched to tracks that you uploaded or purchased in the past, uh, Apple in, in Apple music, it gets marked as unavailable, even though it'll reappear if you upload it. So what happens when you put a file that you own, right? You bought music, you've got the, whatever the AAC or even an MP3, you put it into I, I into either iTunes or the music app, depending on what version of the OS you're on. Uh, it will first look to see if it can match that with a file that is allowed to be matched in Apple's library. If it can, it doesn't upload. It just says it just checks the box and says, OK, you can use this matched app or this matched file. You're good to go. The problem is if that file becomes unmatchable in the future, as Raj points out, then you cannot play it. But if you have the original, which you do. You just remove it from your library and re-upload it. And now instead of matching, it will say there is nothing to match it to. Let's upload it. And when it uploads, then you have access to it because that's how that works. Craziness. You'd think that there could be a better way for Apple to manage this that respects the artist's rights and all of that stuff, but doesn't mess up us users. So uh, so what happened? Did the the database of what you have versus what is allowed in the cloud break or did the audio pro because i assume what it does is that it does some sort of audio profiling like spotify and all that stuff and it's like oh okay yeah i know this song so it it does it or does it match it by the name or the artist or, or by the audio signature i guess is my question so the problem is not that something broke the problem is that a file that was previously licensed and allowed to be matched is no longer part of the list of files that can be matched. And if you matched to it, well, it's not in the database anymore. 
so you can't play it. If a file isn't matchable, then you upload it You're automatically. iTunes or the music app will just automatically upload it. But the problem is if you didn't upload it in the past because it matched, which is the default behavior, and oh, okay. now it can't match, now you're in this limbo land where it you didn't upload it because it, you didn't need to. And of course, all of this is happening. You don't actually get to decide whether it's uploaded or matched. The music app or iTunes decides whether it's uploaded or matched. But if it decided matched in the past and now it doesn't have access to a matched version, you can't play it. So you need to remove it from your library and re add it so that it can upload it. This time it'll look at it and yeah, whatever process it, it does to, to match these things is whatever it does. And it, it, it does look at, at audio signature, but also at metadata at, you know, artist name and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's one of those crazy things. It's nuts. It's nuts. I tell you. All right. Where are we here on time? Oh, good. We've got time. I like it. It, you know, it, um, we asked if, if you folks would want us to, to, and, and, and I'll, well, I'll tell you what we asked and then I'll explain my thought process on this. Uh, we asked all you folks if you wanted us to do one 90 minute episode every week or two say 45 minute episodes every week. It doesn't really change what we do here. It's the same amount of content, just whether we package it, you know, as one or as we have or as two. And not surprisingly, everybody that listens to this show said, no, I'm fine with the 90 minute version. Because, of course, you are because you're still listening. <laughs> the people I would love to poll are the people that no longer listen because the show's too long. <laughs> and so it was interesting hearing. But but and I knew that. As, and this was one of those things where, it, you know, we just came up in the show and we just asked it off the cup. But um, your responses were informative nonetheless, because most of you said, no, no, no. I would much rather get one ep all of the week's content at once instead of having it you know, metered out once one on Monday, one on Wednesday or something like that. So, so that was actually valuable. Uh, there were very, very few of you. There were a lot of responses, but there were very, very few of you that said, I would rather it be chopped up, which again is no great surprise, but we are going to leave it at the 90 minute thing for now. Um, and well, we might be doing some other things with the content to highlight some specific segments, but, uh, but for now, uh, and and probably for the foreseeable future, the main show will be as you are used to this 90 minute thing. The reason we asked is because the show started as a 45 minute show and then, you know, 15 years goes by and, and it's creeped up to 90. So so there you go. But thank you for all your responses. It's great. Feedback at Mackey .com If you have any other thoughts about that. I don't know if I heard you, Dave, even with my new earbuds here. ER4 Pro, I think they are, or something like that. Yeah, here. from Edmund. But, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure you said feedback at MacKeyCab.com. I did. I said feedback at MacKeyCab.com. And John, I think Louie wrote in to feedback. No, no, no. Louis. Mm, uh, pretty sure it's on, Louis. You saw he put that right in there. Oh, did there. he? Don't you see it? Oh, there you go. Oh, I have a little I, smiley right next. To I it. see it. I, you know, that we do have, <laughs> uh, we do have a, a Louis in Montreal who writes in quite a bit. So I, I thought that that was who this was. Uh, so you're right. This is Louis. So take us to Louis, please, John. All right. Louis has a really uh, good one here and we haven't heard back yet, but uh, I hope we do. But um, he says, I have a 2017, 27 inch 5k iMac running Catalina. I'm a firm believer in rebooting my computers at least once a day. I, I mean, that's not going to hurt things other than slowing it down. But I think once a week is, is, it is makes good me for sad because, you know, a lot of computer people say that the way to solve any problem is to turn it off and on again. So um, anyways, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I feel like most problems can be resolved by simply turning the machine off and turning it back on again. As he says, I've always had the schedule in energy saver to shut down my computer at 1145 p.m. every night and then start it back up at 6 a.m. every morning. When I'm out of town, that also assures that I can always remotely access my home machine using splash top. Yep. A very similar but less expensive alternative to log me in. This week, I've had to get up for 6 a.m. several times. Each time I discovered my machine was already booted and in a state consistent with having been shut down and rebooted. 
the new console has proven to be pretty opaque to me. Yes, I agree. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I can see events going back to midnight the previous evening, but I can't pinpoint when the machine booted up. To complicate things, I also recently attached the UPS. I live in Northern California and have been affected by the recent power shutdowns. I connected the UPS's USB cable to the Mac so it can manage shutdown in the case of an outage. I'm pretty sure the problem manifested before the UPS. At any rate, I'll discount that and test tonight. I met a loss how to figure out what is going on. Any suggestions? So I, I, I do want to throw in that, that he yes. shared a tip here. And that is that if you need to, if you regularly need remote access to your computer, going in to energy saver into schedule and turning on just the start or wake up for every day at say 6 a.m. Like he did pick a time. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, although it does, if your computer's in your bedroom, you probably don't want it waking up at say 3 a.m. But having your computer start or wake up at a specific time every day will ensure that you go no more than 24 hours with your computer being off if something switches it off, right? Because it will start back up while you're traveling. So it's like, it's a great little tip and something that I do so that just so that I know, okay, I know that at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, the computer in my office is going to turn on. No, even if I'm not home and then I can remote access in and I can get to it. So, right. Yeah. So my initial thought, Dave is, do you have a cat? <laughs> Okay. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Some something that touches the keyboard will wake it up for sure. Yeah. And cats love computers. You see it all the time. I, they, we, they have, love. We, we now have three. I know. Yeah. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. So you got Puck and uh, you got a you got the the coon cat and then another one now? Well, we no, we've always had we've had Puck for a couple of years. We've had Logan for a long time. Uh and then we just Which is recently, the main coon cat? We just recently added a main coon cat. No. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So that's Bean after after Ender's game. So there you right. Go. So um so my first suggestion, which I did not say in the reply, is make sure that your uh your critters, whether they be cats or rats or or whatever, sure, um, are not waking up your computer just to mess with you. But um anyways, to figure out what's causing this and to get output in the old readable syslog format. His comment being that the current console is pretty much use, useless <laughs> for most humans. Um, you can either issue a command from the terminal, and we actually did this, so I had to dig into the archives here. But um, there is a way to do this from the terminal, and we'll paste the command into our lovingly crafted show notes. But if you say log show style, well, we'll, we'll put it. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Right. There. Anyways, um, there is a way, and uh, the the essence of this is that there is a process called Power D, which is the Power Daemon or Demon, depending on how you pronounce it, and that's the process within Mac OS that handles all of these sleep, wake, and other power events here. So you could do that and pipe it out to a text file, and then look through that to see what is happening around the time that it's waking up. So you know, look at pre 6 a.m. and see who is it could be that the computer is just confused and you know starting it up early i've seen this happen with like time machine backups that i schedule sure later is that it doesn't always do it on the on the spot because you know the computer's busy or, or it's asleep and it doesn't want to wake up i don't know right um the other way to do it, Dave, which I think is probably better, so you could you could send it all to a text file, but you could also run something like consolation. So consolation is utility that, among other things, will take the new style console stuff and output it in a form that you can understand. And so I found here, so, so I dug around, and so um, it has a section called filter, and you can filter on a number of criteria. The one you want to do is say pattern subsystem power D. And then it'll show you all the power D events in the output. So that's another way to do it. Um, ah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and lastly, Dave, if it's a power event, you know, I hate to do the power on power off. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, it could be an SMC. So SMC is the system management controller in the Mac. And it's, a, I guess, you know, a little chip and it has some memory. And sometimes it gets messed up. But Apple has guidance on how to reset it because sometimes these power related operations like starting up or shutting down 
um, will get confused. Or it could be the PRAM. Last I checked, Dave, I think some of these parameters, like you know, the time that you want it to wake up and shut down, could be in the PRAM. So an SMC and or PRAM reset, and actually PRAM reset is included in the SMC article, could be what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'll put a, uh, a link in the show notes to uh, reset the SMC. It's different on every Mac, it, but it is worth going through and kind of learning how to do it I mean, on yours. Yeah. I mean, some is just like pulling the plug for 15 seconds. Others, it's you got to hold down certain keys, right? Yeah. I mean, on yeah. on the on desktop computers, it's it's all pretty um, well on non T2 desktop computers. It is shut down, pull the power cord for 15 seconds. Plug it back in, wait five seconds, then press the power button to turn on your Mac. Um, if you've got T2 computers are all a little bit different. Um, you've got to hold the power button with it shut down and wait a few seconds. And like it, again, it's worth it's worth not only going to the support article and reading it, but do it. Go reset your SMC. You're certainly not going to break. Well, if you do break something, resetting the SMC it's because your computer had a problem to begin with. Um, but it, generally it fixes things very, very rarely would it even break something, but it's worth going through the process so that when you are doing this in a, you know, pressure situation and you're reading the instructions on your iPhone or trying to remember them that you've at least been through it before. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah. I mean, I've had some, weirdness in this respect and so the one thing i found one time is like my mac mini i typically put to sleep when i'm not doing the podcast or playing games or whatever sure and a couple of times i noticed there was a wake and i'm like why did you wake up and here was the reason so i did step similar to what we talked about and as it turns out there was some sort of vibration in the area of the computer and it activated one of my uh user input devices and the machine was like, up, oh, time to wake up. John's here. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, it said like HID, human interface device. It was like, yeah, HID, wake up. Interesting. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. why you're doing that. So uh, it could be that. And again, I'm not, I'm not joking when I say it could be a cat or. Yeah, oh, totally. Or, you know, yeah. or humidity or whatever. Making one of your input devices make the computer think it should wake up. So. Right, 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 right. Yeah, cool. Uh all right, Jurgen writes and asks, uh, he says, the spindle drive of the Fusion drive in my iMac was beginning to fail. I'm going to share his history here only because I think, um, I think, I think it's helpful. It says, so I decided to buy a new Mac Mini uh, 2018 because I'm cheap, or rather because Apple is expensive when it comes to SSDs, <laughs> which he's right. I opted... For the smallest internal SSD, that was because I read on the internet that it would be no problem to put my user account on an external drive. And what can be read on the internet is true, right? So I installed the OS on the internal drive, started with a new user account to log in, and migrated my old user to an external drive. I had nothing but trouble with the account on the external. The permissions were completely messed up. Owner of files would sometimes be my username, sometimes 501 from the old machine. You know the story. I do know this story. Uh, he says, so I went back to my old computer and sized my user account down so it would fit on the internal drive of the new one and migrated again, this time completely to the internal drive because, and that was me being clever for the second time, I could simply put big folders of my home directory on the external. He says, you already guessed it wrong again. It simply is not possible to link folders like documents or music from an external drive to your home directory on the local drive. It was really messy. And I finally ended up having an official home directory on the internal and a secondary home directory on the external, but not all apps work nicely with this combination. So I regularly end up with files in the internal documents folder because some naughty apps won't ask and rather just save their files there. That is not the way I like my computer. So I came up with a new plan, says Jurgen. I will create a completely new user and will put the home directory on an external drive right from the beginning. Then I will manually migrate all my user data and register all my apps again. I will not use migration assistant. I will copy everything manually to make sure that the permissions are set correctly for the new user. But before I do that, I have some questions. 
Do you see a flaw in my master plan? And will I run into any trouble when I have two different user accounts with different usernames on the same Mac and log into that same Apple ID? So I'm going to answer the second question first. No, you shouldn't have a problem with that other than iCloud will sync the data, you know, contacts and calendars and things like that between the two. So as long as you're aware of that, that that's sort of table stakes for the way iCloud works. As far as your master plan. Yeah, I think it's sound. Um, I'm not sure that it's what I would do, though. If if it were me um, and I had a Mac mini with a 128 gig SSD, I would probably just put everything, including my operating system on the external drive and boot from that and have my user account there and all of that. Uh, depending. Really? really? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would think you'd want the OS on the internal drive. Well, it, okay. It, yeah, no, yes. No, no, you're you're not wrong. I would. But at 128 gigs, you're either inheriting the um, the scenario where you have the OS on the external or you're inheriting mm -hmm. a scenario where you've got your user account on the external. And that can be wonky as Jurgen is finding out. Once you get it running, it can be fine, but I'm not sure it's worth the the headache there. Um, I, you, okay. you know, no, I see yeah. what you're saying. It just yeah, seems yeah. unnatural to me. It is, it, but so the is OS breaking. should be on the internal drive, and I'm just saying should because should doesn't mean right or wrong. It's like it's it's a preference. And no, and I, I would I'm, I would probably put a a fresh OS on my internal drive. Uh, in this scenario, I, I might boot from the external, but I would put a fresh OS on the internal just so that it's there oh, in the right, right. right in the it, as a spare or a troubleshooting or, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I think, you know, with SSDs being relatively inexpensive, external SSDs being relatively inexpensive and and fast and all of that, that might be the best way to go. Um, you know, I mean, it, a 256 gig internal I have found both for myself and for everybody in the family that works. Now, what I do is I put photos and music on an external drive in those scenarios. Um, even with a one terabyte internal, I put photos and music on an external. I, there, there's just they, they don't need the speed that an you know, internal SSD can provide. And uh, and while you're right that you can't move the music forward folder to an external drive you can tell the music app or itunes or the photos app to put its library and all of the media files on an external and that works totally fine so depending on how much stuff you actually have in your home folder you might be able to pare it down and fit it on that 128 and if you can great for me i found that 256 is the magic number there and i'm talking about desktop machines with a with a uh, with a laptop, I actually find 256 works fine, but I don't uh, I, you know, I use iCloud Music Library and iCloud Photos. So I let it manage how much stuff is being saved locally. And, and quite frankly, that works out great. So 256 is is has worked out fine for me for a very long time. And I don't see that changing um, anytime right. soon. Yeah. But we're all okay. different. I mean, but, you know, for me and the way I manage things, yeah, 256 is fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was sorely tempted because I saw a Cyber Monday deal on a Mac Mini 2018, but it only had a 256 SSD. And I'm like, Ugh. I, you know, for a mini, again, it's a desktop machine. It, you can easily manage 256, I think. Uh, yeah, and actually, it was external. it was a special through Amazon, I think, and it was mm -hmm. under it was like nine hundred something. Yeah, you know, with I think the i seven and uh, I think eight gigs of RAM. Which yeah, I, I was sorely tempted because they're not in the refurb store yet. So, right, 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 right. Um, while we're talking about SSDs, John, you want to uh, you want to share what you told uh, Todd when he wrote in yeah. about about this? 
Yeah, this could be a, a, a learning journey for all of us here. So okay. uh, basically our friend ADD Todd, who is now in Utah for some bizarre reason, but who knows? <laughs> Utah's <laughs> not that bizarre of a place. Oh, I see. Got it. Okay. <laughs> well, no, he's usually, yeah, I think he's a, a, a coastal. So Got he's it. in Utah. I don't know why and it doesn't really matter. But um, I think the gist of his question is that he was asking, um, John, how in the world did you ever get the SanDisk software to recognize your SSD when you were in your virtual machine. So what is he talking about? So the thing is, a little while ago, I got some SanDisk external SSDs uh, because the price was really good. It was like a one terabyte for like 200 or like less than $200. I'm like, I got to get these. And I use both of them. So I got one terabyte SSDs that are crucial in my two main machines. And then I bought these two SanDisk one terabyte SSDs and an external USB 3 enclosure to do my CCC backup. Works great. Um, but Santis does offer utility and they actually have a you know little little card and they say, hey, you know, download SanDisk SSD dashboard. It lets you uh, do speed tests, use capacity, temperature, firmware updates, which that is important to me, I think. Smart attributes and stuff like that. So it's a it's a really handy utility. The thing is, it's for Windows. So I'm like, how do I get this to work? The only way I was I was able to get it to work, and I think he he verified this in his email. The only way I was get it to work, Dave, is that I was able to run the Windows utility within parallels. And then when I put the drive, when I inserted the drive into the USB port, Parallels, along with most other VMs, will be like, "Hey, I see a USB device. Uh, who do you want to handle it? You want it? You want me to give it to the Mac, or you want me to give it to the PC?" And I'm like, "Well, we'll give it to the PC." And the utility worked flawlessly. Oh, um, that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he even in a follow-up, it's USB, in, right? It. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because USB can be assigned to the virtual machine and truly managed there. That's right. Yeah. 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 Right. right. So their utility though, I got to give them. Uh, so it's not, I don't know if I'd say it's atypical, but the thing is I've had other utilities that totally fail in this scenario, but their utility is smart enough, which over a USB interface versus something like SATA or something like that, it's able to see the drive and actually do things like a firmware update. To me, that is, unusual yeah. because usually you have to be on like the native operating system of the software in order to get that to happen. But apparently between parallels, which is what I was using and the Santa software, it worked. Now his observation was that this did not work if he tried to do it with the boot drive and. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Cause you, cause you can't let the virtual machine manage the boot drive natively because I, I think that's, that's a little yeah, too meta. Think, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the case. And I think that's what ha what is happening in this case. Now, sense. the one thing I could suggest, so he's like, how could I get around this? And and I, I communicated to him a story about the software. So I also have crucial drives and their way of at least updating the firmware is quite different in that they say, oh, download this ISO image, which is actually, I think, a little Unix Okay. Oh, yeah. And then boot that. Right. Right. And I was able to use that to update the firmware in one of my machines. And that actually was an internal drive. But when I tried to do it to an external drive connected via Thunderbolt, it didn't work, which is weird because my understanding is that that's a low level enough connection. So Thunderbolt target disk mode, as far as I know, is like an NVMe connection when, when I researched this. Yeah. So I don't know why their utility did not see it. The problem is when I tried to run the utility on my MacBook Pro, it worked great. When I tried to run it on my Mac mini, it would crash. So I'm like, how do I get around this? But in his case, and I didn't write this to him. So if you're listening, listen <laughs> What I'm what I'm thinking is that you may be able to get around this by putting one of your machines in target disk mode, mm. and then I think the utility may be able to see it. Yeah, yeah, that could, that, yeah, for sure. Because now it's just a really expensive external drive case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but I think because because you're in a VM, it it's not willing to let you get to the guts of the drive. I don't know. I don't yeah, know your experience. Sense. 
Yeah, I mean, no, I I've I've had mixed experience with that for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. So because the two SSDs, I, so I have Crucial and I have SanDisk. I don't know about you. Mm, I have the well. I mean, I've got lots of them in in internal SSDs and uh, and mm-hmm. yeah, I've got Crucial. I I don't know that I have any okay. SanDisk. I have. Uh, I've got a couple of crucials and I think I have an old Kingston one in one of my Macs too. So, yeah, while we're, while we're talking about virtual machines, Brian asked, uh, following up on things from an earlier episode, he says, you guys were talking about migrating a Mojave install into a parallels virtual machine or the like. And he says, I'm trying to do this before I upgrade to Catalina, but you say, uh, how did you do this? And it, he's he's right. This is not nearly as easy as we thought it should be. I had a long discussion, actually, while I was at Mac Tech with uh, one of the folks from uh, from Parallels, and they've just never built an engine to do this because up until now, it has not been a thing that uh, that needs to be built. It may that may change in the future, but at, at the moment, it doesn't exist. So there's no one step path to do this. The steps are number one, you use something like carbon copy cloner to make a disk image of your Mojave install. So do that. And that way you've got it. Then what you have to do is create a brand new virtual machine inside parallels and install a brand new copy of Mojave into it. When that Mojave installation is booting, migration assistant will pop up and or it will offer to pop up let it and then mount the disk image that you made in step one and let it slurp in everything so you can't boot directly from this mojave disk image but you can slurp the data from it into a virtual machine that you can then boot with mojave and access your 32-bit type of stuff so yeah sorry that that it seemed like a good idea and and actually everybody i've talked to with agrees that it's a good idea. It just isn't something that can be done because up until very recently, it hasn't been a, a thing that is needed. And Alex in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream asked, what do you mean by this? What I mean is we now with Catalina, we can't run our virtual or we can't run our 32 bit apps. So my thought was great clone the Mojave installation and just just boot that in some virtualized environment and you're good to go, which would be true. The trick is you can't get there directly. You have to do this clone and then slurp in with migration assistant. So thank you for asking, Alex. Thanks for the clarification. In fact, I'm, I'm sure everybody that's listening appreciates that, too. <laughs> All right. Uh, John, you want to take us to, to Rod? Rod. Yeah, yes, please. I'll take us to Rod. So Rod Sweet. has a good one. So Rod is a blast from the past or at least he has a machine that's a blast from the past. I have a mid-2007, yes, 2007, Core 2 Duo 20-inch iMac running El Capitan running, uh, uh, sitting in our kitchen, being used mostly for iTunes, recipe lookup, and occasional web browsing. Even with these light, stu- light duties, it's painfully slow and almost not worth the trouble. Last month, I upgraded the memory from the original 3 gigabytes to 6, which is the maximum allowed. While this has helped, it's not enough. I'm looking for more cheap ways to improve its performance. On your show, you said many times uh, recommending switching from a rotational to an SSD drive. Um, In situations such as this, where cracking open the machine to replace the drive is challenging, you suggested hanging an external SSD off of a Thunderbolt port and booting from that to improve performance. Alas, my iMac was released before the inclusions of Thunderbolt. What about FireWire 800? Is that fast enough? This iMac has a FireWire 800 port on the back. Would I see performance improvements booting off an external FireWire 800 drive, or would the limitations of the interface speed make the speed boost negligible? So, Number one, hats off to being able to, <laughs> dude, 2007. I've got, I mean, you, th- you thought think, I was bad. I, mean, I think I've got a 2007 iMac running over in the house. Yeah. Yeah. They're totally functional for, you know, for what he's talking about here, but they're slow. Like with today's web browsers and all of that stuff, it's slow. Yeah. 
Right. So um, one of your friends, in, in when you're considering an upgrade, especially for an older machine, the thing is, I don't think it's intentional, but Apple doesn't necessarily tell you the entire truth here. So the tool that I love is Mac Tracker, Dave, because it tells you the truth. So as he found out, this machine, um, although Apple says you can only get four gigs of RAM, he found out you can actually put six gigs and that's the max. So that's a good step in, in the right direction. Um, Unfortunately, the thing is, when you look at this machine, Dave, so it has three USB 2 ports at 480 megabits per second, the FireWire 400 at 400 megabits per second, and then as he noticed, the FireWire 800 port at 800 megabits per second. Um, the only thing I got to say is, Dave, is all of these pale in comparison to the internal SATA 2 interface, which is at three gigabits per second. So my recommendation is... I mean, go to go to iFixit. I think, as far as I know, you can replace the internal drive on this. But I think absolutely, that's that's where I have those crucial SSDs is inside one of those two thousand seven. Okay, yeah. But I think for, for this sure. machine, that is the only remaining thing you can do to increase the speed. It, 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 I would you agree. You could certainly do an, a FireWire eight hundred, but I think you'll be disappointed with the performance. Um. No, I mean, it's or maybe, it, well, you, you know, you could try it. Yeah, I, I I've. I mean, FireWire I is a more efficient protocol. Well, I'm, uh, I don't uh, I mean, FireWire is more efficient than USB, I would say, but it's not more efficient than SATA. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you even if you roll. had well, if you had USB three, which he doesn't, he's got USB two. Right. But if he had USB three, putting an external SSD on there would certainly be the easiest thing. And you probably wouldn't notice a huge amount of difference with it as your boot drive on that machine, but he doesn't have USB three. He's got USB two. That said, when we did, you know, back in, I want to say 2010, I could be off by a year or two in either direction. When we did the kind of great SSD upgrade here at Mac geek, Ab, the first thing I did on every machine was I put, an SSD into a USB to external enclosure, cloned the internal drive to it and booted from it to make sure it would boot before cracking the machine open and putting it inside USB to limited. Like you said, John to 480 megabits per second, right? So 48 megabytes per second ballpark. I realize I'm doing the math the wrong way, but close enough. Uh, no, you're, you, you, I would say you're doing it right. 10, okay. eight, 10. The, the thing is, yeah, I know. You know there's but when I did maybe. that, the machine got way faster because I was booting from an SSD, even though it was on this slower external bus, like way faster. And when I moved those drives inside, I noticed no difference whatsoever. Now, if I ran like a black magic disk speed test, sure, I could see the difference. But experientially, no, the biggest difference was because the SSD has the very, very low latency. So. I, I think if, if certainly on Firewire, that's almost double the speed of USB two. probably going to be fine. Yeah, you'd get a little bit of a boost, especially if you're reading large files or something. But in terms of just booting your OS and all that, probably not much experiential difference to, to between external on Firewire 800 versus internal on SATA two uh, for most people, especially on a machine like like that, you know, 2007. So, uh, you know, what? Did I put mine inside eventually? Yes, absolutely. But did it make a huge difference? No, it didn't. So I, but I agree with you that changing from the rotational drive to an SSD, that's all that's left to do to this machine. And it's not other than getting rid of Mac OS entirely and going with some, you know, Linux build or something that that's going to run more efficiently than El Capitan does. But other than that, no, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. I'm so is the bottom line, give FireWire 800 a shot and otherwise. Open yeah. Her up? <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I would. I mean, I wouldn't crack it open. I, I would definitely do it either over USB or FireWire. FireWire would would give you a little more headroom. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I would do is test it that way and see and see how it does. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. And uh Man, we've got so much more stuff, but 
But John, we're at that ninety minute mark, which which is our newly Oh my uh, gosh. Look at that. I know. It's how it goes. So we kinda have to uh you know, we gotta live within our own within our own limits here. So there you go. Well, don't think of just us, Dave, but the band. I know. It's cold out there. It's still snowing. In yeah, fact, there's I a mean, second storm coming tonight. So yeah. That's what I hear. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Crazy. Right, it's we crazy. told you how to reach us by an email. Um well, you know, there's always this Twitter thing. I'm John F. Ron. He's Dave Hamilton. The podcast is Mac Ecab. The publication is Mac Observer. And there's that guy flying around somewhere, Pilot Pete. I miss Pilot Pete. Yeah. Twitters. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, and especially these days, man, I mean, he's uh, he's Santa, right? Yeah, it, that is true. He really is. That's right. Yep, that's true. Hey, um, go to MacGeekGab.com slash reviews and leave us a review on iTunes. In fact, we got one recently in Apple Pod. I said iTunes. It's Apple Podcasts. It's, it hasn't been called iTunes in a long time. We got one recently in Apple Podcasts by Loves to Shop One from here in the USA saying, <laughs> I enjoy listening to your podcast. My hubby calls me his geek girl. I do learn at least five new things, if not more. Thank you for helping us not so geeky people learn some important and helpful things about our Apple products. Thank you for the review. And seriously, uh, and I'm glad, you know, that you learned stuff. I mean, this is what we this is why we do what we do. Helping to spread the love with those reviews really, really helps. Also, just tell your friends, like, you know, share it. You can share it on Facebook or Twitter or, or just, you know, tell somebody, hey, you might like this podcast because that's how that's the best way for people to learn about. Or, you shows. know, gather around the old Victrola. Or maybe around like a, a Sonos speaker or a HomePod or something like that. You know, like but if either you know or. A, if anybody knows what a Victrola is, you're old. Yeah. Well, that's kind of <laughs> how it goes. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, as fun as this is, it is time for things to wrap up. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks to our sponsors. As we mentioned in the show, we have Capterra.com slash MGG, Eero.com slash MGG, ExpressVPN.com slash MGG, and SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Stay warm. Stay dry. Stay happy. And, and, Make sure that whatever you do, however you are staying, that you don't get caught. Made up.